Dear friends, welcome to the fourth lecture in our series, The Life of Chords. I'm today with, joined by Peter Donahoe, who is going to play a lot of various virtuosic and interesting pieces for us. And we are going to talk about diminished and augmented chords. I have a picture of Liszt here because he had most, probably of all composers, most to do with both of these kinds. So, we'll start with a chord which is called diminished seventh chord. Now, these chords that I'm going to talk to, to you about today, they may, might not be just as important structurally as the ones we were talking about last time. In fact, you probably can do without them. But they bring a lot of color to the music and uh, expression and particular effect. Yeah, so, composers have always been using them for effect. For example, this diminished seventh chord. So that was from the score of King Kong. <laughs> and probably even if you didn't know that, you probably would have guessed that something terrible has happened. Uh, or the gentler version of the same chord, which is a harp glissander. So that has become so popular that it's now something, it's a sound that you can download. It's a library of sounds. Yeah, harp uh, glissando diminished seventh chord, if you want to use it in your piece. Yeah, so it is something like a stock idiom. So uh, if we look at a couple of composers from the 20th century looking back at this chord, uh, Schoenberg, for example, describes this diminished seventh as the expressive chord of the time wherever one wanted to express pain, excitement, anger, or some other strong feeling, there we find almost exclusively the diminished seventh chord. Or Luigi Della Piccola says, every shock, every horror, every rape and abduction, every surprise, every apostrophe, every curse, and sometimes even desperate invocations are underscored by the diminished seventh chord. So, what is it? How do we get to it? Uh, so on, on every note of the scale, we can have a triad. Yeah, we talked about that. Most of them are major and minor. But there is one note of the scale, which is the seventh note of the major scale, where we don't get either a major or minor uh, triad, but we get a very strangely sounded, maybe you can give us that, yes, which, uh, a triad which doesn't form a key. But there is no diminished key. So the, the fifth, yeah, the interval of the fifth between the lower note and the higher note is not the pure consonant fifth that we're used to. It's squeezed, it's diminished. Yes. And so if now we add another step like that, another uh, third on top to it, so make it into a seventh chord, That's our diminished seventh, right? So that is the, the sonority that you want to hear. Uh, where, do we, where do they come from? Where do we get these chords and uh, their associations, their expressive associations? They mainly come from opera. Uh, and probably one of the first instances uh, that we can find comes from an opera by Giovanni Legrenzi. It's actually a popular aria uh, which lots of singers have sung, um, and it amazingly starts from that, uh, from that chord. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an aria about, uh, it's a complaint um, addressed to Cupid, you know, why are you tormenting me like this? Yeah, so how can you create all this torment for me? So it is something, yeah, very tormented, that's how it goes. Yeah, so just the very beginning is already extremely kind of emotional and expressive. Uh, if we take just uh, operas that maybe of the composer that you've never heard about, uh, John, um, Johann Adolf Hasse, um, and you will see then how kind of ordinary people, so to speak, use these chords. Yeah, so these are a couple of recitatives, and uh, every one of them has to, where, where this chord or this interval of diminished seventh appears, uh, has to do something with uh, tears or with kind of exclamation, with pain. 
Uh, for example, the first one, uh, yeah, I'm going to f find F Fabrizio and cry. Yeah, so uh, if you can just give us that uh, sense. <laughs> Madre, yeah, oh, my, oh, poor mother, oh, dear mother. Yeah, so you have all these exclamations and sighs and tears um, in operas. So this is all quite simple, yeah, quite straightforward. But at the same time as Hasse, uh, we have Bach as a contemporary of Hasse. And uh, Bach seems to have discovered the potential of the diminished seventh chord and nobody else has done. You know, he's used it in so many ways. Mm, and I think, uh, I, I can't think of any uh, kind of other composer who has done that. For example, um, there is this chorale, yeah, the literal chorale, Durch uh, Adam's Fall is ganz verdept, which means that because of the fall of Adam, yeah, the, the world is corrupted. Everything has been corrupted. So uh, the melody of that chorale is in the top line, but everything that happens underneath is kind of pictorial. Yeah, so first of all, you have those intervals in the, well, this is an organ piece originally, yeah, so in the pedal you will have those diminished sevenths going down. Like no, just, just separately, yeah. Very strange line. Yeah, it's, it seems like Schoenberg has wrote, <laughs> written it. Yeah, something like that. So that represents Adam's fall. Yeah, and it's very strange. It's very uh, disturbing in a sense. Then in the middle, there is a kind of snaking line, uh, which might even be representing the serpent that, that was uh, implicated in Adam's fall. <laughs> So there's a snaking light. And, the, and then there's a top line, which is just the melody of a chorale and is very simple. Yeah, so there's qu quite a lot of complexity. And, uh, you know, I think if people, when they, they would have heard this music for the first time, they would be extremely surprised because the harmony becomes ex very complex. And it's, uh, it's really disturbed by these diminished sevenths, which appear every now and again, a kind of corrupted almost. Yeah, so if I can ask you to play us the whole piece, it's a very beautiful piece. It's in the, um, in the arrangement by Buzzoni, so it's a piano version. And yes. we'll just hear it complete. Yes, you... of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should, we should clarify maybe that the original is an organ piece, which um, Buzzoni was very, very good at transcribing for the piano. He did many, many of Bach's um, great organ works for piano solo, and this is one of them. A brilliant transcription.
amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's quite amazing, yeah, quite confusing. In really, it's impossible to tell, I think, that it's, it was written yeah, at the beginning of the 18th century. It's, it's so uh, complex. Uh, Bach used uh, the chord also in a very dramatic way. Yeah, if, we're, if you're thinking of kind of exclamation, yeah, or a chord that is really surprising you, really kind of gives you uh, the, the jilt, you know, that makes you, makes, makes you jump. This is how he does it in his uh, St. Matthew Passion, in the very um, important, the very important moment when Pontius Pilate asks the question, which, uh, who are, are we going to save? Is it Jesus or is it going to be Barabbas? And uh, the crowd chooses Barabbas to save. And you will hear this chord. It's very separate from everything that precedes it and that follows it. It's extremely dramatic. Um, that's how it goes. <laughs> It really stands out, yeah, so it, I think there's a direct line from that moment to what you've just heard in King Kong, you know, yeah, this really <laughs> kind of um, incredibly dramatic moment. Uh, another piece which is also astonishing, I think possibly even more astonishing than the chorale prelude that we've heard, is Bach's chromatic fantasia um, and fugue, although we are right now interested in the fantasia. So uh, the title of it, Chromatic, already tells us that it will have this, a lot of these tonal colors. And one of the most important colors is the diminished seventh. And it is used here in all kinds of ways. Uh, one way, for example, could be to make it in, into an extension of a dominant seventh chord so that you get a ninth. Yeah, if you could do that. So it, it, uh, it sort of appears on top there. Uh, another way uh, is to have several diminished chords in a row, kind of snaking downwards. And what that does is completely uh, remove the sense of a key, remove the sense of tonality. Yeah? So it, it disorientates us. There's something woozy about it, isn't there? Uh, there's also a dramatic turning point, yeah, the use of it as, uh, like in St. Matthew Passion. Uh, then it also can be used with a different kind of melodic note, an extra dissonance on top, which becomes very, very plaintive. You know, it's like a sigh, like a lament, but also incredibly e expressive. Finally, another way that he can use it, he can stay on that chord a very long time, but all that that is kind of in yellow um, is basically an elaboration of this chord. And while we are on it, we don't know which key. We've forgotten the key that we were in before. Yeah, so then that allows him to go somewhere else, quite distant, yeah, because we've already forgotten what the key was. So it's, it's a way to kind of completely mislead you and make you lose your way. Uh, so maybe you could play.
sorts of directions and all that, yeah, because the diminished seventh kind of loosened us out of the key. So uh, now I would like you to play the whole of the Fantasia because it's, it's such a marvelous piece and it uh, uh, definitely has this, I think, tragic, a sense of tragedy as well. Uh, yeah, because it's, um, uh, it, it condenses these, these chords to the point of almost kind of unbearable intensity. Thank you. 
extraordinary teeth, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and this is Bach's son uh, saying many years later, uh, no chords is more convenient than the diminished seventh as a means of reaching the most distant key more quickly and with agreeable suddenness. Yes, so obviously he's, he, he must have learned some, a thing or two from his father. And you would think, you know, this is such an encyclopedia of the use of this chord that, you know, there was nothing for Bach's followers to do. Well, thankfully, Bach's music was forgotten for a long time. Yeah? So they were discovering the potential of the diminished seventh chord on their own. And uh, the next chapter of our lecture is about two contexts uh, that scholars have identified in 18th century music in which this chord appears most. And they call them ombra, as in shadow, and tempesta, as in tempest, yeah, or storm. Uh, the, the first word you can see uh, refers uh, to the supernatural, to the supernatural horrors in which the 18th century started taking more and more interest. Mm, and uh, in particular, this is an ode to, to Shakespeare by the composer William Boyce. And there is a moment there, um, if we can just hear where that diminished seventh comes in, it comes in with the word, um, and terror with distorted mean erects the hair and chills the blood. You have these chords coming in. Yes. So that is... Uh, like a bit more. A bit more, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that you know it, it is associated with particular uh, those words, yeah, with terror and um, raised hair. Uh, we have quite a lot of sort of theory about this coming at the same time. Uh, for example, um, Edmund Burke writes about the new aesthetic category, uh, which he calls the sublime. So, kind of something that is more intense than the beautiful something that exceeds our human scale, something that is so strong yeah, that it, it is, uh, kind of excites our feelings almost to an impossible degree. And this is what he says, whatever is fitted to, in any sort to excite the ideas of pain, of danger, and that is to say whatever is in any sort terrible or is conversant about terrible objects or operates in a manner analogous to terror is a source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. And uh, another you know, Scottish poet, uh, James Beattie, writes a few years later about that pleasing horror, yeah, which uh, joined, when joined to words descriptive of terrible ideas, music can invoke quite effectively. Yeah, effectually. So, uh, it's the idea that horror can be pleasing, that it is something that we're looking for in music. And uh, I think the, probably one of the ultimate expressions of this ombra topic, yeah, ombra context, is the, um, the final scene of Moses' Don Giovanni, yeah, where the statue finally comes for him, and it begins precisely with the diminished seventh chord. <laughs> Adorons, 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 adorons
Yeah, so it's full, of course, of other um, elements such as the trombones. Yeah, that are introduced this very kind of funereal rhythm, um, but the, the the harmony and these diminished seventh chords uh, play a, a great role in intensifying this moment. So, um, and uh, we also find that the that very uh, capacity of the diminished sevenths to um, Make, make us forget what the key is, yeah, to lose all orientation is also being considered sublime. So this is the English composer William Crotch writing in 1806, when the harmony and modulations are learned and mysterious, when the ear is unable to anticipate the transitions from chords to chord and from key to key, if the melody and measure are grave, the effect will be sublime. I think we can refer this very much to the chromatic fantasy yeah, that, uh, that you've played for us, because um, although probably the word wouldn't have been used then, but it certainly answers this description. Now, if we talk about the other context, which is the storm, yeah, so there are obviously uh, natural storms yeah, to uh, depict it in music extremely uh, efficiently. For example, in um, the pastoral symphony, yeah, where this, the storm actually interrupts uh, the, the previous movements. The previous movement doesn't uh, have an opportunity to quite finish. Yeah, it's, it's uh, really... Um <laughs> Everything was, was lovely in the previous movement, yeah, and suddenly you really feel like the, the clouds have darkened and you get a bit of rain coming in, yeah, and then finally the um, thunder uh, and lightning come in. And in Beethoven's pieces, which don't have necessarily that pictorial title, yeah, so we don't know, for example, what Appassionato is about, it's not his own title, uh, but we can compare to that. Uh, what we've just heard in the pastoral, and uh, I suppose deduce that also uh, Appassionata has to do something with a storm. Yeah, it might be a storm of kind of emotions and feelings, not necessarily a natural um, occurrence, yeah, but, but it's the same kind of thing uh, that happens there. And I would like you to play also the transition from the unfinished, kind of interrupted, slow movement to the finale. It's extraordinary, yeah, how that chord is also voiced. Yeah, it's quite an unpleasant sound, isn't it? Yeah. I, I remember my, my child had it as an alarm clock, and I also thought that was a very unpleasant way to wake up in the morning. It'll definitely get you out of bed. Um, and uh, there are a couple of more um, 
ways in which uh, he uses the chord later on as well, interrupting uh, the music, yeah, sending us again into this kind of strange um, sense of uncertainty. Yeah? <laughs> I think you have another one, yeah, which, where it also, once again, kind of so sounds like an interruption of the flow of the stream. Um, and every single time it happens with a diminished seventh. Yeah, so you, you really can feel it, yeah, how everything stops, yeah, you suspend it um, without the key uh, for a moment. I was looking for uh, something more modern uh, that would also use this Tempesta context, and I found a, a lovely piece by Thea Musgrave, which is called Turbulent Landscapes. Yeah, so it's actually based on paintings by Turner. And uh, each one of them is, is turbulent in some way. And she uses this diminished harmony almost throughout um, in these pieces. Um, and uh, also, she uses a scale that is associated with this diminished harmony. And that scale is called an octatonic scale. It's called octatonic because it has eight notes in it. So if we kind of half fill in every little bit of the diminished seventh chord, we should be able to get it, if you could just play it. Yeah, very strange scale, unusual scale. So you will hear it for a moment, for a moment in this piece. So it's called Sunrise with Sea Monsters. Yeah, so I think the sea monsters, she uses the tuba to represent <laughs> at least one of the mon monsters, and the tuba is playing this, this strange scale. Yeah, so you can see how that idea, yeah, that context actually sur survived into the 21st century. Well, now we are approaching an interesting topic, which some of you might have already predicted that I will have to, um, uh, to address. Um, there is this... Uh, common perception that one of the intervals, or actually there are two of them, like if you, if you show us how the, the, the interval of the tritone uh, is, part, is part of the dominant seventh, yeah? So then there is another one kind of interlocking with it to create, and yeah. Yeah, so you have kind of two tritones together. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, together. yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and the people get excited about that, yeah, because they have this idea that during the Middle Ages, this interval of a triton was a forbidden interval. And the reason for that was that it was associated with the devil, yeah, Diabolos and Musica. You must have heard that. <laughs> yes, I have. I'm, I must actually. Um tell a really strange story about that. Um, there, was a, there is a comedian who's a very intelligent, incredibly clever man with an, an unbelievable musical brain called Bill Bailey. 
I'm sure many of you know him or know of him. Apparently we look alike and we've never been seen together in the same room. So, but anyway, um, he was interviewed on, I think it was GMTV several years ago uh, in anticipation of a tour that he was doing that, that was around classical music and the funny aspect of it. Uh, and he was trying to explain to the people on GMTV about the tritone. And I've never seen such an expression of total um, blank, glazed over faces that he was greeted with because they were very worried, obviously, that everyone would turn over onto BBC because he was being too intellectual. Um, but it was really very interesting to, to actually discover through Marina that, that, that it's wrong. It's not the case that in medieval times um, the tritone was associated with the devil. Yes, um, people have been looking really hard and looking through about 63 mm. theses. Not in a single one of it uh, there is a, uh, that uh, association. Uh, there is um, a, a description of, of the Triton as something very unpleasant, yeah, something very unpleasant to be, or something to avoid. Mm. Um, but the first time this uh, phrase, Diabolos in Musica, is used is actually 1725, yeah, so well after the Middle Ages. And it's um, by uh, a, a composer and theorist who wrote a book on counterpoint called Fuchs. And uh, it, basically he comes out with this little mnemonic phrase for singers, mi contra fa uh, uh, diabolos in musica. Yeah, so it's something to rem remind them of what not to do when they're singing. Mm -hmm. So maybe the phrase indeed existed, but it pr probably just was a joke. You know, it, it actually, the, the Triton didn't have to be forbidden for that reason. Uh, they were trying to avoid it precisely to avoid that kind of unpleasant sound. And uh, it is considered like the most dissonant interval that there is. Uh, the, the, the ratio, frequency ratio is quite high, so it is quite harsh. And this is why people always represent uh, yeah, car horns or something in music through mm -hmm. with a tritone, like Gershwin, I think, in American in Paris. Yes, so yeah, he, he gives you, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, although the, the, your own car horn is not actually tuned to the triton, it's, <laughs> it's a minor third. Mm. Yeah, but anyway, there's this perception, yeah, that it's the most dissonant mm. and the most unpleasant. And do you mind if I just mention something that's just occurred to me, which, which was Britain's War Requiem, Benjamin Britain's War Requiem, which of course is, is uh, um, in memoriam of all the people who died in the First World War, an incredibly tragic work. Uh, but there's this moment, which I think comes three times, uh, where the choir sings it, something like this. I hope I guess it right. And at that point, the tube of the bells go. And eventually, it resolves onto this, which is the end of the, the requiem. But this bell, which is exactly the, the tritone that we're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's piercing and so incredibly tragic in, in the context. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful moment. I'm, I, it just occurred to me that I remember it well from my youth. Mm -hmm. There's a fantastic representation of the tragedy of, of war. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I think in the, 19, in the 19th century, I'm not quite sure when, and probably from Fuchs, but composers started realizing that it's associated with the devil and started mm. actually using it as a representation of the devil. And the diminished seventh chord also in the context in particular related to, to Satan. Mm. So one very famous example is from um, Weber's opera Der Freischutz, yeah, where you have this uh, wolf, Wolf's Glen scene where the magic bullets uh, are, are made. And these are the bullets which cannot miss their target. Yeah, so obviously they're made with the help of the devil. Uh, and there's this character, he's called Samuel, but actually uh, eventually we realize that it's the devil himself. And every time Samuel appears, you hear the triton and you hear a tremolo and that diminished seventh chord. And it's the first ever leitmotif in music. Yeah, the first ever kind of little uh, snatch of music that is, tells us exactly what is happening. So I just wanted to play you a little bit from that scene. Some 
kind of witches yeah, shouting there, the triton. At the very same time, yeah, very, very close to that, 10 years later, we have Berlioz's Symphony, Symphony Fantastique, and then the um, finale, we have a Witches' Sabbath, yeah, so also starting with the Diminished Seventh, and the, uh, not just one, but the whole kind of um, uh, chain of them descending, uh, like, I don't know, witches cackling with laughter or something like that. Again, very disjointed music. That's well, they're, they're just gathering you know, for the Sabbath, but you feel yeah, that something really, really evil is happening there. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I should have shown this, this first. Yeah, so these are the, the tritons, how they are formed within the diminished seventh chord. And these are uh, our people who came up with the, this idea in the 18th century. One of them actually, Matheson, says um, oh, all the singers call this pleasant interval the devil in music. And uh, you wonder, he might have been sarcastic. Yeah, we don't know how to read this, these three pieces. Or maybe he considered it uh, pleasant. Um, but, uh, you know, it might have been described as hostile to nature, annoying and irritating, but not as the devil. devil. Once again, uh, if we even go sort of later on into the 20th century, th this association just stays. Yeah, so you have a piece by jo George Crumb, which is called uh, Devil's Music. violins and electronics, making it uh, even more unpleasant. <laughs> um, so uh, now we finally come to Liszt, and uh, this is a particularly kind of interesting uh, thread in Liszt's works, because he wrote a lot of works uh, about Mep Mephistopheles. Yeah, so there are at least four Mephisto waltzes, there's a Mephisto polka, uh, there's a Faust uh, symphony, yeah, there is a B minor sonata, which seems to be also connected to, to that idea. Yeah, so there's a whole lot of them. Uh, and uh, he starts, the first time he uses this, you know, triton and diminished harmony for the devil is in his fantasy on uh, Robert le Diable, you know, Robert the Devil, another Maybe opera. Again, yeah, around 18, um, I, th I think it should be 31, actually, not 41. So... So very striking beginning. It's not actually in the opera. He makes it much worse. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, um, and uh, uh, I think, you know, it, some, it might have been something kind of almost autobiographical because both his virtuoso predecessor, Paganini, the other virtuoso violinist, and Liszt, who was so exceptionally virtuosic on the piano, they were compared to the devil. Yeah, it felt that there was something supernatural about their playing. You can see that both Robert Schumann and Clara Schumann uh, describe him as, as uh, the demon. Yeah, the demon's power began to awake. He first toyed with the public as if to test it, then gave it something more profound until every single listener was drawn up into his art. And then the entire mass of the audience began to rise and fall exactly in accordance with his will. With the exception of Paganini, I have never encountered any artist who possessed to such a high degree Liszt's powers of subjugating, elevating, and leading the public. Yes, I really felt it was demonic power. And Clara Schumann, who really d disliked him, I think, quite a lot, uh, had to admit as well, he played as always with a truly demonic bravura. He lorded it over the piano like a devil. I know no other way to express it. Yeah, so I think he was aware um, that this was happening and uh, it possibly, you know, some of his struggles mm, uh, were represented in music as well because, you, as you might know, he later ended up um, being a minor cleric, yeah, so a religious figure and wearing a religious dress. Yeah, so he certainly was kind of torn between heaven and hell. 
And uh, some of these struggles are represented in his amazing, extremely long work, which is his piano sonata in B minor. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a theme, although, again, there is no title there. It doesn't tell us that it's Mep Mephistopheles or that it's devilish, but we can sort of guess, can't we, if you could give us a sense of it. of diminished seventh chord thrown in there. Yeah, so I kind of put circles around them all. Um, and, and on the uh, very last page, even up to the very, it's very long work, I can't remember how, how long, yes, yeah, so 14? 31 and a half minutes. 31 and a half minutes, yeah. So <laughs> depends on how fast depends you play. Depends on who's playing it. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, but up to the last page, yeah, even on the last page, you still get um, a little bit of that Mephistopheles theme and the harmony. And then after that, yeah, only that last two lines, there are just pure triads, which are supposed to be more kind of, yeah, religious and heavenly. Yes, it's a, resol a resolution of the conflict of the whole piece. Um. So you think, yeah, that there is a resolution. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really like to think so, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> There's a massive climax earlier on in the piece, uh -huh. on, a, on the diminished seventh itself. It really makes um, a very big point of the actual harmony. May I play it? Yeah, it's sure. It's just a few seconds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And of course, like in the Faust Symphony, where there is actually a movement, which is called Mephistopheles, uh, that also yeah, begins in the, um, in the same way. Again, yeah, this laughter, demonic laughter. Uh, now we, we're moving to the augmented triad, and this is going to be a much shorter chapter because it it's, hasn't been used for so long. Yeah, and in fact, uh, a lot of people, when even they recognized that there was a theoretical possibility to get this this triad, um, it uh, appears in the minor. Yeah, if, like if we're in C minor, it will be on note three of the chord. Yeah, so it's kind of there. Um, but uh, it was not used very much, yeah, and uh, they referred to it as chord of extraordinary hardness, as sharp musical spice, uh, and also, as one of the theorists said, something quite useless. Yeah, so um, they were not very keen on, on using it, with the exception of Haydn, yeah, because Haydn would try anything. He literally, we've, we've played so many examples from Haydn uh, for various things. Yeah, he really experiments with things. So in one of the string quartets, um, in the trio of the menuet of all places, which is supposed to be extremely kind of simple music, but you have this uh, augmented triad, um, which, well, yeah, maybe we, you can give us first, you know, what it actually sounds like. An augmented just, triad? Just, yeah, any, yeah. 
Yeah, so there are kind of two big thirds stuck together, so it's more than a fifth, yeah, so it's a kind of augmented fifth rather mm -hmm. than a diminished one, yeah, so uh, very strange sounding uh, chord. So uh, they actually show you when it can happen. It's a kind of painful moment with a little bit of an extra melodic note added in. And then the second time that kind of music comes in, it's actually diminished seventh. So as if Haydn knew what lecture I was going to, to. So he has both augmented tried and then diminished seventh, and he comes back to that. And every time that, that happens, you will notice it. really making a meal out of it, yes. <laughs> mm. uh, so that is a very strange, but quite a kind of isolated uh, example. Um, and uh, even as late as 1850, uh, one of the theorists, A.B. Marx, said, if we take the major triad and raise the fifth, we are confronted by the shrill sound of the augmented triad. No one has ever dared to use several of these triads in success succession, and we should do nothing to encourage this. <laughs> <laughs> so sure enough, Liszt, yeah, three years later, does exactly the same thing. Uh, so that's quite an extraordinary, hor horrible noise. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, he, he, he was particularly uh, loved this idea of using this chord and was proud of it. He actually wrote about it. He, the augmented triad was still something remarkable at the time. Wagner had used these chords for the Venusberg in Tannhäuser. Actually, there's not much there. Um, but I had written them for the first time already in 1841. Yeah, so there was a little bit of competition going on of who would use this, this chord. This brought much adverse criticism upon me, he says, but I didn't trouble over the matter. Um, so uh, the first time in 41, yeah, he mentions the, the 1841, he actually uses it um, very prominently yeah, as a kind of individual chord, not connected to anything. Um, something that, that is, occupies a whole bar. And it's in uh, Liszt's Pertrag sonnet, which it first appears as a, as a song. Yeah, later on, he turns it into a piano piece. And the text of that sonnet, it's about love, how love kind of uh, completely tears you apart, infatuation. Yeah, he says, I find no peace, but have no war to wage. I fear, I hope, I burn and turn into ice. So you're kind of torn into these different um, um, uh, s s directions, and I think that's what it probably is associated with. And you can see how it, it can be beautiful, yeah, but it still creates this moment of strangeness. And uh, most famously, he used that chord at the beginning of his Faust symphony. Um, amazingly, even back in the 18th century, one of the theorists says that, it, although it's a very unpleasant sound, but it would be used to, uh, g good to use in the context of death, suffering, and doubt. And I like this, a doubt yeah, is one of the things that he wants to use it for. And Liszt, of course, uh, uses it exactly yeah, for Faust's doubts and questions. And it's an extraordinary beginning. I will play it. The first 12 notes are all different. So basically, he uses up um, what f four of these triads, four times three. Yeah, he uses up all the notes of the chromatic scale. Mm -hmm. 
There is no key in this passage at all, yeah, because again, just like a diminished seventh chord, it gives us this sense of strangeness. And um, I mean, the, the next person yeah, to use all 12 notes like that was Schoenberg. <laughs> so Liszt really does some amazing kind of ex experiments um, in that regard. Uh, Liszt uh, communicated very much with the Russian composers, who learned a lot from him. and. Uh, he learned a lot from them, so there was a kind of going back and forth between them. And Russian composers started using this uh, triad as part of a, something that we uh, associate very much with the Russian harmony. You will kind of recognize this sort of sliding uh, from major to minor and back. If you could give us a little bit, little bit of that Scheherazade uh, tune. to a lot of people like a very Russian music because they used this, this pattern basically to death in almost every piece, in almost every theme where they wanted to create a Russian style, they would go from major to minor via the augmented triad and then very often back also uh, via the augmented triad. Now, uh, just coming back to um, Liszt's uh, sonata for a moment, um, I wanted to... Uh, introduce a moment when the uh, augmented triad is used as part of a very special chord, a kind of portal that transfers us from one yeah, part of the sonata into another one in a very unusual way. Yeah, so this is actually a, a dominant seventh with a raised fifth. Yeah, so the, the augmented triad is kind of part of the dominant seventh chord. But um, the point is yeah, that it's, it shouldn't be in the key uh, where we're starting from, yeah, which is G minor. So it, it shouldn't be there. Um, it appears in a magical way. So that absolutely magical moment, and once again, yeah, he, he uses, um, well, this is called enharmonicism, yeah, where one chord is kind of completely renamed. Yeah, all the notes you can see here in his manuscript, yeah, they all had um, uh, flats, yeah, and the next chord has all sharps and even a double sharp. So everything kind of, it, it sort of um, morphs into something else, yeah, that is useful for a distant key. So again, this is what, what yeah, he uses these chords for. Again, moments of kind of sublimity, sublime beauty, and uh, very unusual modulation. Uh, late in life, Liszt uh, tried even to write pieces where the chord almost becomes a tonic, yeah, the augmented triad. He sort of sits on it for a very long time. This is again in the context of death. Yeah, so this is one uh, piece called La Lugubre Gondola. So it's a, it's a funeral gondola that takes the body you know, floating uh, on the lagoon. Uh, to the cemetery. So it's kind of supposed to float in limbo yeah, between life and death.
we sit on this court, it's not going. It's a, a, an extraordinary kind of expansion of the um, remit of that um, court. So uh, we have a sense that Liszt in his late um, years was trying various ways to unsettle tonality and actually write some music that would possibly be without a key. Uh, and one of them, he actually called that. He called it bagatelle sans tonality. Yes, so bagatelle without a key. Uh, it's uh, also in the manuscript had a, a subtitle, uh, Mephisto Waltz, number four. So again, and it starts with a triton, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, so it's again, uh, yeah, some, a portrayal of evil. And it's a highly capricious tone picture, as one of the listeners said, which whirls through all the keys and then ends abruptly on a chord of the diminished sounds. It doesn't actually have a proper ending. Mm. So um, Peter's going to play the whole of it. It's quite short. Tried also is associated with its own scale, and that's the whole tone scale. If you could just give us a kind of that's an even weirder scale. <laughs> and uh, the first time that was used um, um, in a very dramatic way was by Glinka in his um, scene of abduction of, of Ludmilla. Yeah, she's abducted in the middle of a wedding feast, and this uh, evil sorcerer comes in and grabs her, and they grab her away, and this strange scale, which Glinka called chemical scale, yeah, sounds in the whole of the show. He was 
extremely proud of that. And uh, then all the Russians also wanted to use that scale. Mussorgsky used it for Boris's nightmares and things like that. And uh, Debussy, who was very keen on Mussorgsky, um, also got interested in that scale. And then it became very much part of his language. Uh, so we, at the very end, yeah, we'll have this mini recital with, with Peter playing uh, a couple of pieces. One of them is called Voile, uh, which uh, is translated as veils or sails. Yeah, we don't know. So it's something misty, so I've chosen kind of a picture for you to represent that. Uh, and that is all, uh, except for the little middle section, yeah, it's all full of um, these augmented triads and whole tone harmonies of <coughs> various sorts. It is, in fact, almost the whole piece is based on the same harmony, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that, that on one occasion when I was playing this piece, I didn't realize that the piano pedal had stopped working properly. And because it, it sounds fine, <laughs> all on the same pedal. Yeah, so you can leave it on. <laughs> yeah. and, and then I finished the piece and, and, of course, backed away from the piano in readiness for the next one and realized the piano was just continuing to, to, to play <laughs> the sound and it wouldn't stop, which was when the whole concert yeah. was canceled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the second piece um, is uh, uh, called uh, The Joyous Island, L'Ile Joyeuse, and in it, um, uh, that scale is used in a very different con context and actually quite unusual. It's not for something horrible or, or death related, it's the opposite. Yeah, it's the joys of love. He was inspired by Watteau's pictures um, of all kinds of you know, things going on in the 18th century, which was very decadent. And uh, I think it gives, it, it gives you a contrast. You will hear a lot of kind of major chords, yeah, which kind of fanfares and very joyful. But there is also this uh, dizziness that comes from the, the whole tone, which I think adds yeah, something into it. So um, that is, uh, I've come to the end of my lecture, so that now we're going, just going to hear these two pieces from Peter. So please give him a bit of applause before that happens while I find <laughs> the...
I'd like to thank um, Professor Prolova Walker. That was an incredible, an incredible lecture. We all feel really educated from Passionata to, to the shadows and the devils. And particularly, I'd like to thank Peter Donahue that made the evening and was a real pleasure for all of us. And I think we've all been very privileged tonight.